Okay, great. Good afternoon, good evening and good morning from wherever you're joining us from today. My name's Sarah and I'm the Program and Event Manager at the Microsoft Reactor in Sydney, Australia. Welcome to another Microsoft Reactor live stream event. Uh, please note that today's session is um, a Teams meeting, so when you're joining, please keep your microphone and camera off um, until the Q&A towards the end of the session. Just letting you know that this is also being recorded and an on-demand version will be available in the next couple of days on the Reactor YouTube channel. So for today, we are excited to welcome as part of our Accessibility August sessions, Megan Towns and Greg Alchin. Sorry if I said that incorrectly. <laughs> and we've also got David Woodbridge, um, who's going to be introduced a little bit later on. But for now, I'll introduce both Megan and Greg for them to kick off. So Megan has more than 10 years experience integrating technology in the classroom as an English and computing teacher. She's also worked as an IT integrator to train and inspire teachers to integrate technologies into their practice. In her current role as a modern workplace specialist at Microsoft, Megan supports IT pros in schools along with governing bodies from across all sectors of Australia to empower their schools to unlock the potential of Microsoft technologies for their students and both teachers. Uh, and we've also got Greg here, and Greg is an award-winning inclusive design specialist, keynote speaker, author, and disability advocate with over 30 years of experience across education, community, commercial and government contexts. Um, Greg's expertise encompasses inclusive education, smart connected environments, inclusive publishing, privacy and inclusive procurement of ICT. Um, so also helping to moderate today's event, we've got Sheba Ford here, who is our community and program manager at Microsoft. Um, you will see I've put into the comments section for today a check-in link with the event code 14279. Please check in for today. We'll be able to provide you with some additional resources um, after the event. Um, we'll be speaking for about an hour with about 10 minutes for questions. However, do send us your questions throughout in the chat section and we'll try and answer as many as possible. And at the end, I'll also share with you guys a link to our feedback survey with the same event code 14279. So if you have time to fill that out before you head off for the rest of your afternoon, that would be awesome. But for now, I'd like to hand the floor over to Greg and Megan to begin. So thank Thank you both and over to you. Thank you kindly. All right, folks, hi. Um, let's get started. What I want to do is just take us through from the start. We've got a, a nice agenda today. So we're going to look at shifting the dial on accessibility, shifting the mindsets on at my, Microsoft, which is what Megan's going to talk about, some presentations by Kylie Kingdom, Aaron Gardner, then my dear friend David Woodbridge, and then a little Q&A session. But let's get started. So shifting the dial on accessibility. What I want to talk about first out is that our purpose is about equal access. Now, that's the language we use in the Disability Discrimination Act and a whole range of other things. What it's really important about is that our goal is to provide that useful and engaging content or experiences that change how people feel, think and act. It doesn't matter whether you're a teacher or you're in business whether you're writing a memo, creating a, some learning materials, in the end, what we're doing is trying to change how people feel, think and act. So a great app, a great website, a great service is all about that. The question is, can everybody do that? Now, equal access means that it's gotta be barrier free. It means that everything has to be perceivable. By that, I mean that you can either see it or hear it or touch it. If you can't do that, then you've got a barrier. The same as we want it simple to understand and use. And finally, it's about it being personalized so that it will work with the inbuilt accessibility features on your device. So whatever your platform, whether you're on a mobile or desktop or laptop, they've all got some great accessibility features. Some have got better ones than others, but it's really about how you personalize that, that approach. Equal access is also about a great user experience for everybody. Accessibility is part of that. Usability is part of that. So, uh, and then that creates a really simple and engaging user experience. The ultimate in user experience, have a look at how Disney does it. Think about how Disney designs things 
to not only attract people there, but to retain people at the park. It's all about being a great user experience, but their experiences also have in built in them great accessibility and great usability. And equal access begins at the concept stage. Ask yourself a couple of simple questions. What's the purpose of your design? How do you want people to feel, think and act? What are the potential barriers? And how are you going to remove those barriers? Because that's the thing. If you're the one who's designed this, you're the one who's either created or removing the barriers. So you've got to be the one to take responsibility for that process. Now, what does equal access do? It affords everybody good dignity. And here, we, and that's what we want from a, a customer service and a customer experience or a great user experience or to putting on my education, how it would be a great learning experience. We want everybody to have independent access. In other words, that it's designed so it doesn't assume that assistance is required. I would want anybody with their diverse range of sensory and physical needs to be able to do it independently. Also, I want equitable access. Now, we say that it's designed so it doesn't take longer. Now, years ago, when back in the, the early 80s there, when we started to bring in a mandate ramps and uh, into buildings and providing that equal access. In some cases, you had to go around to the back of the pub to get in. And you had to go down little laneways. That wasn't equitable access. Yes, you could get in, but it took you longer. You didn't give you that dignity of coming through the front door. We're a good shopping centre, as an example. Everybody gets in that front door from the start because those properly designed automatic doors open up because they want you in there. So think about that from your content, your document, learning experience, your app. How do you provide equitable access? Because you want everybody in. The other thing is that you want to think about participation and growth. We want everybody to be able to participate. We want it natural and expected. And from a learning design perspective, we want all of our learners to grow. So how does what you're creating enable all learners to grow? If it's not, if it's not happening in an independent and equi equitable way, you're not affording dignity. The other element is satisfaction. Is it designed so that you feel at ease with it, that you feel safe, that you feel engaged, you feel connected? It's something that draws you back. When you've got that, when you've got those four things, independent access, equitable access, participation and growth and satisfaction, you've afforded your users dignity. And that's something we want every one of us to do is afford everybody. We all want dignity. We want to afford everybody dignity. There are our four key elements. Equal access is nowadays is multi-platform. Is it mobile? Is it on a tablet? a laptop or a desktop device, it doesn't matter. But if I look at, for instance, at Department of Education, you'll notice that the front traffic on the website is about 80% mobile. So making sure everything works that way. If it doesn't, we're creating barriers. Think about the old clunky PDFs, having to pinch and zoom those on a, um, a mobile or a tablet device, it doesn't work. And we haven't thought about good design that makes it more uh, e providing that equal access for everybody. Here's the problem. Whilst our intent, we all go, yes, we all want equal access, it's poorly implemented. Because if we assume we represent the average, that's when we have some problems. So what will happen is about 50, 55% of the population can use your product. But there is another 25% of people that have difficulty using it. So that's not allowing, they're going to disengage. There's another 20% of the population that are unable to use the product. Now, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a developer, none of us can afford to go, oh, I'm not going to worry about 45% of my class or I'm not going to worry about 45% of my market. I want to worry about the 100% of my market. And that's the problem when we assume that we represent the average, because we don't. And those assumptions cause us problems. 
assumptions are made, when we make those assumptions about our, our audience and our professional requirements, it limits our thinking. And also those assumptions impact on our level of awareness of the tools and the techniques. Now, I noticed Michael O'Leary was here in the group. Michael with Spectronics, they have some brilliant additional tools that you can have. But also the other things about assumptions on, on how it fails equal access is our focus on quality assurance and attention to detail. It's poor because we think about it as this last minute thing and that's when things fall over. We've got to change our mindsets. And one of the things that helped me change my mindsets was some of the work with Microsoft. So it comes down to this, our mindsets, our methods, our tools can either raise or remove the barriers that shape the ability of others to access, participate, contribute, enjoy, and grow. And that's the thing, whether you're designing that learning material or that app or service, your mindsets and your methods and your tools raise or remove that, that bar. Think about the good design that's out there. Think about the curb cuts. I love curb cuts, why? That simple, easy design from back in the early 80s enabled equal access across the road. So a person who was in a wheelchair, who was a wheelchair user had independent and equitable access. They had that dignity. But guess what? That good design's afforded everybody that dignity because whether you've got a shopping trolley, a stroller, you've got a heavy suitcase. Remember that thing we used to do called travel? It allows you to get from one side to the other. And that inclusion also inspires innovation. We see it in our modern vehicle. Now, for people who know me, my left eye is a prosthesis. I'm legally blind in the right. I'm going to talk about a car for a moment, even though I'm not allowed to drive one. When we move those seats up and, and back on their rails, we're catering for different leg lengths. The same with the squab on the seat. We're catering for different arm lengths and body heights and sizes and shapes. The same with the steering column as well. All of that Deep thinking has provided the flexibility to personalise. Same as Microsoft Adaptive Game Controller, the uh, OXO Good Grips um, Potato Peeler and Vegetable Peeler, originally designed by the, the company's owners for his wife who had um, significant physical disability. Now she could end up a nice and easy grip, allowed her to use that properly so she could undertake the tasks that she wanted to do. We've all benefited from that design. The same with a D-lock handle. And of course, on my iPhone, all the inbuilt accessibility features on there that have transformed things over the last decade or so. But inclusion inspires innovation. Now, the other mindset change we've got to have is it's kind of like a scene from Monty Python's with Life of Brian, where yes, we're all individuals. Because everybody's unique. You think about, what happens to us as we age and ability and how that changes over time. That's a really important change for us. So if you talk to my, my wife or my grandkids, they'll tell me that yes, my hearing has changed. Whilst there's always been problems with my sight, my hearing has changed as I've got older. Look, and the other mindset, no one's average. You think about it, you could be of average height, which I am, but I have short legs, so I'm long, I'm long in the body. So what are those attributes of average? Is it your height, your weight, your reach, your torso, shoulders, chest, waist, hips, legs? Just think about that's the physical attributes. You could be average in one, but not in the other. And the same from a cognitive perspective. Memory, language, knowledge, reading, vocab, curiosity, perception, cognition and interest. Now. You could be above or below average in a range of those things, and it could also change depending upon the subject matter. If it was to do with mathematics, my language and knowledge and interest in that is going to be low. If it's about really nice dark chocolate and good whiskey, my memory and my language and my knowledge and all of those things is going to be above average in those. So no one's average. That's the most important message that you can get. We're all individual. The other thing is that everyone encounters barriers. So if you think about it, any of us that have been to a noisy hotel, we've all at one time or another been deaf in a pub, as we would say. So you can go from having a permanent 
disability or permanent impairment and being deaf, you could have a temporary impairment and have an ear infection, or you could have that situational impairment. The same as when we talk about from one arm to an arm injury to a new parent. There is that continuum, but the simple formula, and this is from Department of Foreign Affairs and Trading, is disability equals um, impairment plus barriers. Yes, I have a visual impairment, but in some situations, if I have a barrier, I'm disabled. If the barrier is not there, I'm not disabled. This means we hit a bigger case. In the US on their census data at the moment, there's about 26,000 people at the moment with a permanent loss of one arm. There are 13 million people with a temporary loss of one arm, and there's another 8 million people who are new parents. So guess what? Designed for the people with a permanent impairment. In other words, designed for 26,000, and you benefit 21 million. That's a huge return on investment. It also means that you're hitting a much bigger market than what you thought. Also, hey, everyone experiences a disability. Under the age of 18, there's about one in nine that have a permanent disability. But as we get older, we start to see some wear and tear in the body. So people, their focal length of their eyes is changing. And we're starting to see some other wear and tear. At the age of 55, it's one in three in the population. At the age of 67, which is retirement, it's one in two. And that's the thing. If you live long enough, you will all have some form of disability. So the market for this is huge. It's designed for everyone and not designed for some. And to learn more about that, I'd like to pass you across to the wonderful Megan Towns. Well, thank you, sir. I feel very seen by your uh, 40 year old wear and tear. I'm 43 years old. I got glasses this year. I went to the podi podiatrist yesterday and I've got two more specialist appointments coming up. So looking forward to these years ahead. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. So let me share my screen in um, over here. Got pretty good time. Excellent. So, um, yeah, thanks, Greg. I'm um, going to, to chat a little bit now about, I guess, Microsoft's journey um, around inclusive design. Um, so we have a pretty passionate uh, mission here at Microsoft to empower every person and organization on the planet to achieve more. Um, and I definitely see us doing that and living and breathing that through not just our technologies, but also our people and our culture. And I think that really began back in um, 2014 when Satya Nadella uh, took over as CEO of Microsoft. Um, and like all things, even um, uh, the, the potato pillar that Greg showed, um, often a, a drive to change and innovate comes from a personal experience. Um, and one of Satya's sons um, it has uh, cerebral palsy, um, and I think it's his lived experience that has really wanted to, to drive the culture of our company to ensure that we are designing for all people. Um, and so... For us, accessibility is a, an, an imperative, um, like those stats that Greg just showed. Um, you know, there are a number of people across the globe that, um, yeah, are living with disabilities and many of those who need assistive technology. So if we can design for them, we're designing for all. So that um, mission for us is something that we take very, very seriously. So we're taking an integrated approach um, to inclusion um, and embedding access accessibility everywhere we can in our organization um, and it starts with that mindset change through our culture um, and embracing a, a culture of inclusion looking at the different systems and processes we take so that um, inclusion is part of the system from beginning to finish um, looking at our products obviously and there's lots of examples um, coming up as well as from a couple of our um, teachers that we're talking to today uh, and then also looking to the future and looking at disrupting innovation so that we can um, change what's possible um, for, for people with disabilities. So when we look at um, accessibility and the, the link on screen will take you to our Microsoft homepage for accessibility. Um, the accessible technologies um, for us are often powered by um, AI um, and looking to unlock potential um, through six different areas of vision, hearing, neurodiversity, learning, mobility and mental health. Um, and Greg, I think, was using some of the graphics from our inclusive design um, kit. So uh, if you, you need to or want to um, look at our inclusive toolkit, um, you can go to aka.ms forward slash inclusive design. Um, 
And we actually have two resources there that you can download. One is the toolkit, which um, further explains a lot of what Greg has taken us through already. Uh, and the second download is actually some activities that you might take your um, organization through, your startup through, your group of teachers through, um, that really get you to understand what good inclusive design looks like. Really recommend that you check out those resources. I've used them a lot um, in some of, some of my workshops. Um, uh, so last little piece is around building the, the foundation for future success in the context of education. Um, we're pretty passionate about um, student growth um, and being able to, you know, when you're designing for inclusivity, students can um, grow their potential and gain independence. But teachers are also more empowered to engage every single learner in their classroom when they are designing for inclusivity, but when they've, when they've also got technology available to them that's inclusive. Um, and finally, schools as a whole can build reputations as positive places when they're promoting equity and inclusion. So we've got a whole heap of tools um, built into our technologies, particularly across office, that we um, promote within the education sector. Um, so built-in subtitles um, occur in a number of different technologies across PowerPoint as an and as a standalone uh, tool. We have Office Lens, um, which is a great app built into both iPhone um, and the other platform, Android now, um, where students, uh, and a lot of them are doing this now, especially in the remote learning context, are taking photographs of text on um, uh, from a, a book and having that text read aloud to support their learning. Um, we've also got Accessibility Checker as well, which is a, a really nice button built into uh, our office suite, which allows you to check how accessible your document is. Microsoft Stream, when you upload videos to that space, it's automatically transcribing the audio uh, or video of those recordings. And across Windows 10 and soon to be Windows 11, um, the ease of access settings also make using a PC more accessible, as well as the peripherals that can plug into that. And then finally, I think um, we, yeah, we're, we're looking to um, uh, enable all students to achieve more with access to our built-in um, uh, what are we calling them? Inclusive classroom tools. So learning tools um, and specifically immersive reader assists with comprehension and um, fluency. We've got text suggestions when you type into both, you know, um, Word, Office, um, as well as Windows 10. You've got dictation tools. I think it's Windows H uh, is the keyboard shortcut on Windows to dictate directly into your documents. And then we've also got editor now to improve, uh, to, to make your documents easier to read. So that's just a little bit about Microsoft's mindset and where we've come um, and hopefully where we're going to with um, further innovations. So yeah, that's, that's a little bit about uh, mindset and um, how we're building our technologies for education. What we've got now for the, the last half-ish of this session is some conversations. Um, with some fabulous humans from across Australia. Um, two of them I recorded earlier in the week um, and the third um, conversation we will be doing live with David. So Kylie Kingdon um, is the Dean of Innovation at Emmanuel College um, over in WA. Uh, she's a classroom teacher um, and does a, a lot of great stuff across her school. Um, and we have a bit of a chat to her about how she uses some of the Microsoft technologies to empower students across her school. Then we'll chat to um, Aaron Gardner, who's a deputy principal at one of uh, the department's schools uh, for specific purposes uh, out there at Campbelltown Way, Yandalora School. Um, he took some time out yesterday of a pretty packed schedule, really, to, um, to chat to me as well. So I'll play the videos. Um, Greg, myself, and even David, if he wants to chime in, uh, we'll have a bit of a chat after each one of those videos. But I will, without further ado, go back in time and have a chat uh, with Kylie. As soon as I figure out how to use my computer. Oh, there we go. Well done, Megan. And I just realized I didn't share sound. Well done, Megan, again. Let me share my screen back in. <laughs> how good am I with technology? I should do this for a job. All right. And let's play that one more time. All right. Awesome. So um, what mindset do you approach with accessibility in your, your teaching, Kylie? Okay. So for me, accessibility is uh, very, very important when we're looking at Everybody, everybody should be taught accessibility tools. Um, and it's important to all students, not those who are just on IEPs or PLPs or need the tools to, ac uh, to access the information. So it benefits everybody. Um, and it's something that I teach at the beginning of the year. Um, teaching high school students, uh, the students who need the accessibility tools often don't want to use them because they stand out. 
Uh, and that's a real problem that we have. So at the beginning of the year, I spent an entire week looking at different tools that can assist students with reading information or um, improving their writing. And it's not taught as accessibility tools, it's just tools. Um, so that's really, really important. Absolutely. I remember um, when I first started using um, Immersive Reader um, and students loved using it to edit their work. So while, yeah, it was seen as a tool to improve reading comprehension for other students, um, some of the students just picked it up as a way to, you know, you know really um, high level students with great literacy skills were using it as an editing tool. So, yeah, I think it's a map. Um, second question, um, speaking of tools, um, what sort of tools and, and services do you use um, or do you encourage with your students in those sessions and throughout the year? Yeah, so my everyday tools, um, immersive reader and subtitles. So I teach my students how to use immersive reader at the beginning of the year. Um, and as you mentioned, we talk about how it can improve your writing, how it can uh, help you read large pieces of, of information, um, especially if, you know, I get I'm a history teacher, so I give kids articles to read. Like, right, your homework tonight is to read this article. And you can do that sitting in your bed with your laptop or put it on a immersive reader and go for a walk around the block. Yeah. Um, so that's, you know, really important. Um, and students are always encouraged to bring headphones to my class. So if they do have to do some, some reading, you can do that. And you see kids of all abilities plugging in for a little bit, reading, unplugging and doing their work. Um, the subtitles. So I teach both face to face and uh, virtual and subtitles for me are super important, especially with um, students who have English as a second language. Uh, so I always use pre uh, present live when I'm using PowerPoint um, and I always have captions turned on when I am doing a Teams calls. Uh, so I've taught my students how to access the different languages in uh, PowerPoint live uh, for their captions. And that allows them to move backwards and forwards um, in the PowerPoint, which is also very handy for those kids who need to go back and just quickly read over something. Um, and uh, you know, I, I used it with my higher level uh history students when we were talking to Russian history students and talking about Russian history. So we actually used that to, uh, when things got a little bit difficult um, talking, uh, we used the subtitles to help each other out. So there's an example of accessibility for you know, high performing students um, that, that they loved. I love it. That's amazing. Um, yeah, so many different ideas that I'm sure lots of people out there will be able to, to draw on and expand in their own context as well. So, so some great ideas, thanks. Oh, that was really running together as a sentence. Um, so final question, um, we've we'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, yeah, we've been talking about it a bit, um, is the concept that we're all designers. So I guess, how do you um, uh, design to include? Yeah, so designing to include, uh, I must admit, my designing to include was shocking before I started teaching uh, online as far as um, be even before COVID started. Um, I learned this little button called Accessibility Checker, and it's now part of my proofreading when I'm creating documents to go online. Um, I've become a lot better in terms of um, typing in alternative text uh, for images and sorting out hyperlinks. Um, so I think it's really important that uh, people make themselves aware of this and, and use that Accessibility Checker. And I learn something new every time I run it. Um, and, and I have to go away and, and read, okay, what exactly, who is this helping out? Um, how can I do this on a regular basis? So I say designing courses where accessibility tools are taught to everyone is a way of assisting everybody is a really, really good way of, of going about it. Um, and using examples of uh, using accessibility tools for students that uh, they might not be thinking about. So for example, doing your homework, going for a walk, listening to a immersive reader. So designing is super important. You need to spend some time thinking about the accessibility of your documents and things that you're putting online. And that accessibility um, checker button is my is my go-to, is my saviour. I love it. Kelly Kingdon, thank you so much for your time. No worries, thank you very much. Have a good day. Oh, ooh, am I unmuted? Yes, excellent. Um, thoughts about that, um, Greg? As yeah, look, I think it's, <laughs> Um, Megan, I, I love what you, Kylie was saying. And look, for me, you spell check, you grammar check, you accessibility check your document before it leaves your, your uh, desktop or your device. Um, it's how I afford dignity. 
but it's also picking up on that design piece that design means that we've made some considered decisions. Mm. And I think that's the other thing that's important in whatever our context is thinking about what are those considered decisions. And finally, I think the other tool on there, and you've made a quick mention of it, is Microsoft Editor. I love Editor on, on Word Online to improve the clarity of my writing, not only from an easy read perspective, but it doesn't matter what I'm writing. Um, it's a great yep. tool. And it's built in now in, in mm. Windows 10 and within Edge as well. And, you know, as a former primary teacher, but I, I, I moonlighted as an English teacher for a while as well, I thought I was pretty good with the words and stuff, but it turns out that was a lie because that blue button pops up for me all the time. And I like it, the clarity especially. <laughs> I can bang yeah. on forever out loud, but it turns out I can bang on forever on a, a type document as well, and it just makes me more concise. Actually, Greg, I think the other key point there too is the fact that accessibility is not, is not just for quote people with a disability it's for everybody yeah. so you know you talked previously about you know temporary or permanent disabilities and everybody has got a permanent or temporary disability depending on what you're doing during the day so mm. you know any tool that allows you to do something whether it's under accessibility or not because I, I've often heard you know streaming tech journalists saying I don't know why they put this under accessibility because it's so useful well, it's actually useful for everybody. So, you know, whether you've got a disability or not, go ahead and use it. And the fact that you can pop in your headphones and use immersive reader, absolutely fantastic. Go for it. Yeah, I, I fully agree, Dave. And I think, look, the other part there, I'm talking about immersive reader, it kind of also allows me to pretend I'm multitasking. It means that I can listen to a document, uh, maybe not going for a walk, but actually preparing part of dinner or doing some other tasks. Mm. Um, and, you know, depending on what your lifestyle is like, that's so cool to have that there. I really, really love it. Yeah, I have read aloud. I use read aloud from Edge all yeah. the time now, so that if I am doing something that doesn't require too much cognitive load, I have uh, maybe it's a bit of training or a news article or something like that, and I'll have that read aloud to read that aloud to me, so I can mul well, multitask. Is no apparently not a real thing, but anyway, um, it allows me to do many things at the same time. All right, <laughs> um, so let's um, head into uh, a bit of a chat uh, with Aaron. Um, actually had to to uh, trim uh, a bit of a conversation off either side of, of Aaron's uh, little conversation, but that's okay. Um, so this one goes for about 10 minutes um, and then we'll come back have a chat before we have a, a bigger chat with David. Learning takes place. What are the, yeah, what are the methods specifically? Look, fundamentally, I've had all my executive sort of lead from example, make sure their programs are accessible. They've got the diversity, the dif um, differentiation, that they have uh, those accessibility functions already um, brought in. But one of the key features, especially for the Department of Education right now, is to make a mandate that all our content that we create is accessible. Um, and that's one thing that um, actually Microsoft has helped us significantly with is the uh, accessibility um, features that have been implemented and also the ones that check for accessibility standards. Mm. Um, so that's been a really interesting, um, as a content creator myself, and I actually say I'm a content creator, because especially with, in line with COVID at the moment, I'm creating a lot of content that's um, taken by a whole range of people, and I can't gauge what the audience is going to be. So I have to keep that accessibility in the back of my mind, and I'm getting my teachers to do the same. We always consider things like the SAMA model to make sure that we're not just purely substituting, we're actually doing something. I'm asking my teachers, what are you doing in addition to it? Yes, substitution is fine, but what are we doing to augment it? How are we creating new lessons that are going to make it accessible, but also might even strengthen the skills of some of our users who are often disadvantaged um, and might find that this actual lesson will actually um, enhance their skills um, and, and promote them in terms of rather than sort of put them at a disadvantage um, in, in a perception for their disability. So we and we run that through our personalised learning plans, making sure it's communication focused, making sure that we look at having a communication model that's been set up or having an expectation of a communication model. And then we're looking at the technologies and also the software that will be used to um, to meet that. So we've we've used trial devices in place. Um, a lot of the, a lot of what I've seen in the last decade has been massive shifts in terms of not only the technology, but also the software as well. We're seeing operating systems like Windows that basically have accessibility features baked into them, where previously it was third party. We're looking at um, plug and play solutions where 
previously it was integrated um, proprietary software and hardware that was fifteen twenty thousand dollars in the space of five years now being taken up by hardware that is um, developed and you can get whatever hardware you want you can in a lot of cases it's um, operating system agnostic you just basically plug and play ready to go and there you go yeah. um, so we're looking to this future where uh, the methods are basically open for everyone and they're much cheaper and much more accessible. Yeah, and I think it comes back to that, you know, designing to include. If if software, manif yeah, if the creators of software and content are designing to include, then there should never be anything that needs to be added on because the software should be accessible in the first place. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah, you already mentioned a, a few different sort of um, tools, but are there specific tools and services that you use to ensure accessible learning takes place? Well, yeah, I mean, in terms of the IT infrastructure, we've actually, um, within the school, that the Department of Education does a really good job of supporting those types of hardwares. But one of the things, I, I mean, I'll be honest, I learned a lot of my stuff on the job. Um, I now have a speech pathologist I work specifically with, but we go through a lot of things in checking accessibility, um, especially with the Office 365 products. Um, Things like Immersive Reader with um, Microsoft Edge, we've started utilising that because little known facts for a lot of times and people don't realise it has board maker in integrated into it. And this is something that we utilise every day as a special need um, con um, uh, environment. But the funny thing is that people are actually taking it in the mainstream and realising it has such benefit for some of their learners. Mm -hmm. So we're actually finding that we're becoming more of the skills that are being brought into mainstream where it was usually the other way around, where we were seeking our professional learning and that engagement with our mainstream to get those sort of like key skills. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at translating features. I worked in previously in a setting which was in Bankstown and it was significant non English speaking background community community. And we the um, the integration of translator features from um, Edge and were, were remarkable for us because then we could look at creating content that was accessible to all of our um, uh, communities. Um, it wasn't limited to the English speakers and we knew that we were going to um, see a lot more engagement from our parent community, which was um, historically low at that time um, and it just meant that things became um, engaging for uh, for our staff because they saw success for them their students we saw um, one of my most um, one of my most proudest moments was a simple switch assembly that was set up for a child um, who sadly passed but I know that one of the things before she passed away is that she managed to use a digital a digital text um, and there wasn't a lot of expectations for her, and she basically used a simple single switch assembly. And we did a little bit of. And I wasn't trained, and I didn't have a speech pathologist, and um, but we made it work. And the technologies at play were rudimentary and limited at the time, but yet she still learned how to use a digital tool to access her own digital texts. And in my mind, that gave her a quality of life that even a single switch assembly can have a massive difference. Um, and so keeping things such as operating systems and software and things like that open-ended and giving those flexibility to have different peripherals just plug and play, the Xbox ad adaptive controller that I've been using frequently has been amazing because it just basically works. It works as, um, as an Xbox controller and you can remap all the um, inputs, which basically means like, and I've said this with my speech pathologist, with one input, you can get a student that's basically making general re reflections and inflections. With a two-switch assembly, they can start using a communication model. With 25 inputs, you can increase the efficiency. So a lot of, all right. So like I said, we had to cut that one short just in the interest of time to give plenty of time for the, the Greg and David show. Um, thoughts about that one, uh, uh, that conversation from Aaron, who obviously works in a, a school, um, uh, a Department of Ed school here in New South Wales. What I love is it's, it's the big conversation, Megan, about what we're now finding baked in, in mm. our uh, a range of operating systems and a range of applications. And um, it's been a wonderfully uh, empowering piece of disruptive innovation mm. because now we're going like with office 365 as an example you go okay in department of education every, every teacher every employee in that organization has that tool so they have that capability to use all the wonderful accessibility features um, 
within each of the applications to suit their own personal um, needs, but also to create and include for everybody in that process. And that's mm -hmm. really, really transformative when you just go, yeah, guys, you've all got it. So it's Absolutely. not a barrier. We're removing the barriers to creating to, to inclusion in that process. And I found the, the comment really interesting around the fact that, you know, in the past, Aaron was always, they were always looking to mainstream schools for the ideas and the technologies. And now it, it's actually flipped itself in the last few years. Um, and yeah. mainstream schools are looking to them for, for these tools and technologies that can help all students. I thought that was a really interesting comment as well. Yeah, and I think yeah. what it also does is you're looking at different um, types of ways of using the tools and coming up with different ways of mm. learning. Now, David, I'm about to jump onto your slide. I want to introduce you to everybody if I can. You're an incredible accessibility ambassador with over three decades of experience in assistive tech and mainstream technology, uh, and you're currently the National Access, Access Technology Advisor for Vision Australia and the uh, Vision Store. Now, folks, if you don't know, David also produces a series of wonderful po uh, podcasts, uh, Talking Tech and IC. He is known globally um, as an expert in assistive technology uh, for people who are blind and low vision. And uh, I'm honoured to call him a, uh, a friend and um, a reprobate. Um, <laughs> David, um, Megan, can you just flick the slide for us to the next one? David, one of the tools you and I were talking about earlier on this week was seeing AI, um, and it says on the, the app store there, it says it's a free app that narrates the world around you. Can you tell us a little bit more about what it does, but also how it's changed your life? Yeah, so just leading into that a little bit too is the fact that um, some people just associate Microsoft with Windows, and Microsoft's gone far beyond just Windows anymore. So I tend to view Microsoft as a platform enabler, whether you're using Windows, Mac, Android, iOS, gaming consoles, you name it, Microsoft's got a finger in it. So mm. um, so that leads me to sort of iOS and seeing AI because it's kind of available on Android. But what seeing AI, AI, AI is, is a collection of apps in one application. And we they, the app calls them channels. So you switch between different channels depending on what you want to do. And this is all a part about the AI stuff that Microsoft's into. So for example, the first channel is short text. So I can point the camera of my iPhone to any text and it will start reading it straight away. That's why it's called short text. So if I get something out of the, the cupboard and I want to find out what it is, I can just wave my phone at it and hey presto, it'll start talking straight away. If I want to do a formal document scanning, then there's a, a next channel is called document. And that will then just read the whole page to me like a normal optical character recognition process. So that's sort of the, the, the plain old exciting boring stuff but what Microsoft has then done is taken that a lot further because they go hey this is a good camera let's do some really cool stuff with it. So for example the product barcode identification I can just put my camera across the um, across the, the whether it's a jar or a packet and then what Microsoft's done is that said as soon as we start detecting the barcode we're going to play a sound so then you can slow down a bit. And as the sound gets louder, you know you're getting closer to the barcode and then we'll read the barcode out to you. So that's actually pretty amazing stuff. With the new LiDAR technology, which is the, the, the length of time it takes light to back, to back sorry, bounce off objects, what, um, what Microsoft's done is incorporated that into the CIA app. So I can then put what are called beacons, which I'll talk about in a little while when we talk about another application where I can get uh, seeing AI to identify the items in a room. So let's say, for example, I've gone into a conference room and I want to put a beacon on my chair, then I can set a beacon. And then when I walk back into the room, uh, I can then ask or go to the, the LiDAR or the what's called the world channel, and that will guide me back to the chair through artificial intelligence and object recognition, both distance and whether the chair's in front of me, to the left, behind me, or whatever else. And then there's other applications such as scene identification to find out what's around me as far as, you know, trees, post boxes, sheds, all that sort of cool stuff. Light detection to see if lights are on and off, being totally blind at nighttime. Money identification, so you can tell what currency you've got out of your wallet, whether it's a 
you know, five dollar, ten dollar bill, and person identification. So, if I've got somebody coming to the room and I've previously taken a picture of that person, it'll say, "Mr. Greg Ratbag has come into the room. Time to run away in the opposite direction," um, or stuff like that. So, but that's all in one free application from Microsoft. So again, it's called Seeing AI. And it's just an absolutely amazing tool. When you consider it does about 10 things that, you know, in, in the last video we heard that, you know, you had to buy hardware to do most of this stuff. Well, this just is just this is just in one free app from Microsoft now. It's just absolutely incredible. And, and that app sitting in your hand too, because it's on a mobile device. It's not a, it's in something clunky extra that you've got to carry around as well, exactly. isn't it? Yeah. And it can connect yeah. to glasses, can't it, as well? That's the next one. That's the next one. That's um, Soundscape. Uh, no. so, yeah. So, so I'll, Megan, you might want to jump to that next one because um, talking about the AI, there's another great app that you use, David, called Soundscape. And it says that Soundscape's a map uh, delivered in 3D sound. How the hell does that work? So this, this app's pretty amazing, and again, it's free. Um, and again, sadly, it's only on iOS because I'd love to be on Android as well. Um, that's a hint, hint, by the way, Megan, Microsoft, Microsoft, Microsoft. Um, so the, the way Soundscape works is it's based on open maps. So like your normal, you know, traditional GPS, you can it'll tell you what streets you're coming up to and what your cross street is. But where this comes absolutely alive is I'm currently wearing what are called Bose audio 3D sunglasses. And these pair up to the um, to the Soundscape app. And it's really funny when you first pair them because, because they're uh, 3D, you sort of got to do this sort of figure eight thing in the air in front of you. And it looks like you're having a bit of a dance to yourself because you're waving your hands around with a pair of sunglasses. I was going to say Harry Potter. That's it. Oh, yes. I, I could be doing the, the, the yeah. magic, what is it, uh, Leviosa or something like that. So. Yeah. Um, so when you pair them, um, when I'm walking down the street, not only do I get told that, you know, a Connell Street is off to my right, but it also only says it into my right ear. So I'm getting that, the, the verbal stuff about turning to, uh, you know, a Connell Street being on the right, but plus it being in my right ear. But then it gets even more exciting where you can put a what are called beacons. Now, I mentioned beacons in seeing AI where I could put beacons in an environment such as in, a, in the chair in the conference room. But I can also put beacons in the environment. So for example, I've got a, a walk that I love to go on with my seeing eye dog, which goes for about three kilometers. Now it's got little Overcast. offshoots now, download this on show. that. Your OnlyFans screwing themselves. The work of adult entertainers is the, being um, disrupted again. Sorry, After the subscriber only website OnlyFans announced it will ban adult material. That. Meanwhile, an just, office in Bucharest is showing how post COVID workplace life can look like with antivirus so innovations. Guys attachment there we go jeez that was it that was liberating um sometimes things talk sometimes things talk too much <laughs> um so getting back to soundscape and beacons so let's say for example so as i was saying these these bicycle offshoots they go off but there's no indication that they're there there's no you know turn left no right there's just a you know this very thin path for bicyclists to go back to the main road so what i've done with soundscape is with my wife's assistance, I've gone for a long, long walk and I've marked each of those bicycle tracks. So the first one says exit near coffee shop. The second one says exit near school. The third one says exit near bridge. Um, and me being a sort of a fantasy person, I've, I've called it exit near troll bridge. Um, and they're all marked. So when I come up to them, what Soundscape will tell me is um, marker, uh, cycle track off to coffee shop in 10 meters which means i can then independently not only navigate around the roads but i can also navigate around off track type stuff and speaking back on roads again i've got this really horrible nasty road and being blind when you walk up a hill i, I just sort of love to know when i'm getting close to the top because half the time i give up halfway up and go oh god is this road ever going to end uh, so what I've done is I've set a beacon for myself high off halfway up this hill that says, come on, Woody, you've only got about another 40, 50 steps to go. Don't stop now. Um, so even that's a bit of encouragement. And all, all around, I guess when COVID stops, between here 
on the Central Coast in Gosford and where I work in Parramatta in Sydney at Vision Australia, I must have about 78 markers. So just one example of one more marker, then I'll stop, um, is when I get off the train at Strathfield and I've got to then change platforms to get on the Central Coast train to go to Gosford, I've got a beacon marked. So that as soon as I get off the train, it tells me how far that beacon is away to where the ramp is to get off that platform. So it'll say if it's either behind me or in front of me and how far it's away. So rather than saying to my guide dog, find the way and we're going in the opposite direction, I can then walk off in the right direction and say, find the ramp and hey presto, we can find the ramp. I'm going the right direction. She's going the right direction and everybody's happy. So it's just absolutely amazing. And again, that's just soundscape. You don't have to use it with the audio 3D Bose um, headphones. You can also use them with another bone conduction header set of headphones called Aftershocks, but you don't get that sort of 3D audio. News. Now, breaking experience. news. Perth confirmed to host <laughs> AFL Grand Final if McGee unavailable. <laughs> and uh, that, David, j just on that, with the being able to set the Back beacons. And... Notification mm -hmm. center, navbar. I'm just going to turn the voiceover off. Three of my notifications. <laughs> right. And, and open maps. You can also do a bit of crowdsourcing in that too, can't you? You can. And speaking of crowdsourcing, the other thing you can do is Soundscape, and this is actually very cool. So I've just gone on for a walk, because with COVID, I've been uh, discovering things about my neighbourhood that I never knew existed. So mm -hmm. uh, and for some odd reason, I love walking across bridges. Bridges are my thing at the moment. So I found this really cool old-fashioned wooden bridge that goes trundle, trundle, trundle when you walk across it. And what Soundscape does is if I put a marker on certain directions, so I put a marker on every street corner that takes me to this sort of, you know, trundle troll type bridge, I can, I can now go back in, choose that marker that start off that walk and turn on what's called street view, which virtually takes me to that location. And then I can actually virtually walk that route again to remind myself that I've got to turn left at Pine Top, I've got to turn right at Mount View, I've got to turn left again at Walk View, um, and so on. And it means that not only can I find out the directions, but I can also memorise that route if I haven't been there for a while. So, you know, the last time I've been to um, Vision Australia and Paramount now is coming up to 18 months now. I can't remember the exact zigzag and zig that I've got to do between Parramatta Station and work. So I've just recently started to use Street View again to remind myself what it's like to get from Paramount Station to work purely by doing the virtual Street View. It's just absolutely amazing. Mm. That is seriously cool. And I mean, and that's the wonderful thing about good design such as this, about how it, well, it transforms people's lives, but it's afforded you that dignity of independent and equitable access, hasn't it? And to be able to participate. So all those things we talked about at the start about dignity, mm. that's what you've been afforded in that process. It is. And again, again, it's just, I mean, I've, I was talking to somebody the other day and they said, oh, I didn't know that app existed for, for the Soundscape. And they said, oh, my goodness, even I could use that sort of app. That's actually really, really, really handy because, you know, when I'm walking along and I'm, I'm tuning out, mm. it'd be really nice if I could set little beacons uh, to remind me when to, you know, get off the get off the track and that sort of stuff. So, you know, again, it's because the way that Soundscape works, I mean, yes, I've got a screen reader on my iPhone and my Android phone that talks to me, but, you know, the, the self-voicing in Soundscape, you don't have to run accessibility. It just, it talks itself and you can just go ahead and use it. So, because some people say, oh, you know, I can't use these apps because I don't have any accessibility tools running. Um, Soundscape or CNI, doesn't really care whether you're running accessibility or not. The apps are designed to perform their function and they just run like any other application that you're using your smartphone. Awesome. So, mate, uh, and Code Jumper, David, that's another one. I don't know a lot about this. But can mm. you tell me what Code Jumper actually is? So, this was a, um, an engineer at Microsoft who uh, had a blind son. And she wanted to get into STEM and learn how to do coding and that sort of stuff. So what they came up with was this little hub, uh, which is called the Code Jumper Hub. And the way this works is that 
There's an app called Code Jumper that you can run on your Windows computer or on your Android phone. Um, there's no iOS version at the moment, but that's American Printing House's job to get that hopefully up and running sometime next year. And what happens is uh, this connects via Bluetooth to the Android phone or the Windows, I was going to say Windows phone, to the Microsoft Windows PC. And then what you do, you then plug in to one of these four ports, these little modules. And these little modules, um, which have got speed and duration for different sounds. Uh, so it could be like a band playing, animal noises, um, you know, rainforest sounds, frogs, all that sort of stuff. And with these buttons here on the front, because this application is self-voicing, a child can learn how to actually code by each time they plug in one of these physical modules, that's a line of code. So for example, mm. if I was using mm. the animal one, it would say frog at one time speed or frog at four times speed. If I plugged in the next module and I had it say symbol, it might say, so frog one at one time speed, symbol at 2.5 times speed. And then I can get this hub then to read back that code line by line and if you've made an error it'll actually make a sort of a little burpy type noise and so you know you've done an error and that's completely independent of the actual pc if i'm a, a you know i'm an okay pc user and i i can use narrator or other screen readers i use large print i can also read the screen as well which comes in quite handy but Besides these um, modules that are just called play modules, I've also got, this is a merge module. So you've got one port here to continue your code, but then you've got two cables here. That can you, you just can lift merge, that one up a little bit yep, for us, David? Yep, that that's it, great. Merge from, that you can merge from different codes. So there's your single yep. one to go back into your code. There's your two cables. The one that I absolutely love, which is my favorite one, uh, if I can find it, is this one. This is the if, if then, or true or false statement. Oh, wow. Yeah, so That's you've got cool. the two codes coming, two ports coming in here. Yep. And again, your single line going out there. So again, one would come in here, one would come in there. So for example, if it's a duck, go and do something else. If it's not a duck, <laughs> um, and it might be a, a something else, like a, a goose, then go and do something else on this port. So that's your true or false statement. And then if you want to get really, really jazzy, we've also got our loop statements. Here's our loop. So we have our loop like that. So again, I'd have the code coming into the loop. It then comes around, and I haven't got another cable plugged in, but if I did have that, I plug it into the bottom to make a loop physically. And that's mm -hmm. what's important about this, that physically the child can feel that I've done a loop. Now, not mm. only can I do a loop, but if I take this and plug that into there and then plug that into there, what I've done now, I've created a loop that also includes one of the play modules. So what I can say to a child is, okay, so what we've done, we've created a loop coming in from the hub You've got the round cable going around. We've got a play one here that might be, say, a sheep at one time speed. It comes back around here, and then we've got our rest of our code running. This button here then controls how many times we want the sheep to make a, a, a bar noise, whatever it is. So I've been set up between one and nine. And then um, just to show you how advanced this stuff gets, and I haven't got them out at the moment, but you can also stick in constants and variables. And it's a really cool one that says infinite, <laughs> which sounds what it sounds like. You can just get to sit there and constantly go ba 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 until you stop it. Um, um, oh, look, but... what I'm loving about that, and Megan, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm just thinking about all classrooms where I'm where I'm teaching coding from a cognitive perspective. This is something so many kids from a, that concrete understanding would would help them so much. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we always mm. talk about physical coding being such an important first step in, in computational thinking skills in the younger years. Mm. You know, that sort of technology opens it up to all. Yeah. And, and the, the fact that you can get, the, so what they tend to say is 
four to five kids playing on one one co jumper kit. Um, so you know it's inclusive learning because mm. all the children can learn in. And the really cool thing is you can make your own custom sounds. So not only can you say to the kids, you know, I want you to do some coding to do certain things in it. I want you to do say the frog jumping in the pond uh, and something else. But then you, what you can also say is. Okay, I want you to go outside and and get some creative sounds that you can come back and say do a, a coded story, um, and that includes everybody in the classroom. So not so you don't have a separate person off in the off in the corner with a support person. Everybody is inclusive, doing the whole thing and learning how to code. It's just absolutely incredible. I think that's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. So I'm just conscious of time. Um, we've got yep. a couple of minutes over. Um, I could talk to the two of you all day, mainly for the banter, which they're just honestly there hasn't been enough of voice. But I'm just saying, let's let's improve that. Next <laughs> just time. let's lift it up. That's um, it. So there's a couple of links on screen. Um, I'll make sure I share those in the chat as well. But the links link to the download for the inclusive design uh, toolkit. We have a, a fabulous um, Microsoft Learn Accessibility Fundamentals course on the Microsoft Learn site. Um, everyone from all industries, um, from all walks of life, um, I encourage you to complete that um, fundamentals course. It will um, change the way you work and the way you design. Uh, and finally, that accessibility homepage from Microsoft at microsoft.com forward slash accessibility uh, will also be of benefit. Thanks, everyone. I think there's a survey in the chat as well. And big thanks to Greg and David as well for being here today. Um, probably hand over to Sarah to wrap things up. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you, ball Thank boys. You. Thank you, ball girls. <laughs> Thank you very much for presenting with us today at the Microsoft Reactor in Sydney. Um, and thank you to everyone for tuning in. I see we've put those links in that um, question section there. Um, so they're available, including the survey as well.